So thank you all for joining us today from around South Australia and Australia. I'm Debbie Pry, the Artistic Programs Manager at Guildhouse, and I welcome you to the Revision Speaker Series. Thank you for being here. This series of conversations is aimed at increasing connectivity within the arts during this time of disconnect to offer an opportunity for artists to increase their well-being and to find new modes of sustainability within their practice. Community is at the heart of the September sessions. Speakers and participants will unpack the ways in which they create, engage with and serve communities, especially in times of crisis. Complementing the speaker series is a tech mentor program enabling artists to grow skills where they're needed most. We have more info on that on our website with the first rounds of interest closing on September 30. So that's open to SA artists. So feel free to have a look at that. Guildhouse has received support from the Australia Council ADAPT Fund for the revision program, in addition to support from the Day Family Foundation and Creative Partnerships Australia, for which we are very grateful. I'm speaking with you from Ghana land in South Australia. I pay my respects to the traditional elders of this land, past, present and emerging, and I acknowledge the rich and ongoing creative culture of the Aboriginal people. Today, I'll be talking to artist and curator Kent Wilson, and before we begin, I'll quickly go through some housekeeping. You can ask questions at any time. You can pop them in the chat box and we'll address them towards the end of the session. If you'd like to verbally ask your question, just write, I'd like to ask my question in the chat box and we'll turn your mic on when it's the appropriate time. We also have some links in the chat enabling you to read this session through a live transcription service. So if you have difficult hearing or if the, the sound isn't working very well, that's a useful tool to use if you open in a new window. And you're also welcome to say hi and tell us the land you are joining us from. Kent Wilson is a curator, writer and artist in Melbourne, Kyneton and Bendigo. For the past three years, Kent has been a senior curator at La Trobe Arts Institute. He is known for his innovative programming, contemporary curatorial practice, research oriented engagement and collaborative style. In 2016, he co-founded Kyneton Contemporary Incorporated, a collective of regional, re regionally based arts professionals dedicated to cultivating quality arts practice, meaningful community engagement and capacity building in regional Victoria. And he currently co-directs the Kyneton Contemporary Art Trian Triennial, also known as KCAT. Tell us more, Kent Wilson. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Hi, Debbie. Thank you. <laughs> G'day everybody, um, I'm coming to you from Tungwarung country in central Victoria um, and it's a real pleasure and a treat for me actually to talk to many of you who are on Ghana country. I grew up in Salisbury, so um, many of you probably know exactly where that is um, and spent some time also there. I lived in Salisbury for a while and then in Burnside, uh, two very different socioeconomic kind of <laughs> Um, and have lived in a variety of different places and now find myself in central Victoria in Kyneton. Um, so I think it probably the, the, uh, a way to give an introduction uh, to the way that I work um, and some of the projects that I've worked on is to give a little background into uh, myself. Um, people are obviously driven by their, their interests and their skill set. So a quick background check into sort of who I am and, and how I came to be where I am now um, is probably helpful. So um, I, I first, uh, I went, went to school, I went to a couple of posh private schools, Pulteney Grammar in Adelaide, Caulfield Grammar here, Salisbury Primary to start with. Um, so I have a bit of a mixed background. I've played football, I've uh, worked in insurance um, and uh, taught at university and now um, I'm a senior curator at a university art institute. I've got a sort of mixed background. Um, now, as far as, uh, as far as art goes, I came to art sort of late in my life, at 30. Um, I studied commerce originally and marketing and economics was my main interest and I worked for a while in the corporate world. Wasn't right for me and ended up starting all over again at age 30. I went back to art school, first year art school, started fresh. Um, and naturally part of my background uh, fed into my art practice. So. As an artist, my interest was in the relationship between the natural world and the cultural world. So I was interested in things like patterns in nature that replicate themselves in our cultural life. 
And my main fo focus of interest in my studies and my postgrad studies was around the idea that um, systems, whether they're natural systems, biological systems, the way plants grow, the way forests, ecosystems developed, have parallels in our cultural systems, the way our education system works, the way the finance market works, the way politics works. There's a, there is a, an interesting reflection across those two different sort of spheres. Um, and there's, a, there's, an, there's an aesthetic quality to the way systems operate, the way they develop, the way they, they process, the functionality of systems. There's an aesthetic quality to that. And in the late 60s and early 70s, there were a few artists working in, in this area, the idea of um, systems aesthetics. Hans Hacker, who is a German-American uh, artist, is probably the, the major touchstone artist for that, that kind of body of work. Um, so I started as a, at art school making artwork. I was making artwork with plants. I was first painting plants and then making installations growing plants. And my interest in that using plants was with artwork and artwork is activated by an audience engaging with it. You can make an artwork for yourself, or put it in your shed in your studio. And it's, it's not really an artwork until an audience member, a viewer engages with that artwork. And I started using plants as a way to kind of make manifest physically that relationship. So plants will thrive by having greater carbon dioxide injected into their atmosphere. A human being coming into a gallery space with a plant develops a, an, an actual physical relationship with that plant, sharing oxygen and carbon dioxide, moisture in the air. There's an actual physical relationship. To me, that was a metaphor, um, an expression of a metaphor about a, a, you know, a viewer engaging with an artwork. Could be looking at a painting, same sort of thing. With a plant, it just becomes more obviously physically manifest that connection, that actual physical connection. But I still believe that the relationship between the audience member and the art is just as strong, is just as physical as that relationship between a human body and a plant. Um, then I started partly because of my background and partly because I was a mature age student at university, organizing shows. Um, and I started thinking about the form of um, an exhibition as my medium, that um, an exhibition is really the, the final outcome of an artwork, like this painting and sculpture and photography and ceramics. Um, but then the actual, the actual moment at which they become potent artworks is the moment at which an audience is engaging with that work. And the exhibition is the dominant form of that, of that process. So I started thinking about the exhibition as my medium. And because I was good at organizing people and good at communicating ideas and explaining things and organizing funding and money and money and talking to people about why they might want to support these things, curating sort of became my um, natural um, occupation at that point. Um, and then it's, all, it's sort of just been a gradual evolution of taking that process and expanding it and expanding it. So at first it was exhibitions in gallery spaces, then it was exhibitions in outside of gallery spaces in different sorts of architectural spaces, and then onto utilizing a whole town as an exhibition framework to um, provide an opportunity of engaging art and artists. So that's kind of the, the evolution. Another, another aspect too that was, that's important to understanding my practice, I suppose, um, and to some of the ideas that are relevant to, to KCAT in particular, um, is the idea of uh, relationships and networks. So at an art nerd level and a philosophically nerd level, there's an idea of, um, by Bruno Latour about actor network theory. Um, and the crux of it is simply that all objects, all things, all human beings and living things operate together in a composition of relationships between each other. And the most important thing really, and in fact, in many ways, the only real thing is the relationships between. The relationships is what makes those other objects exist. So it's kind of a, a way of thinking 
like an exercise in thinking. We often, you know, kind of naturally assume that uh, the objects are what exist and then my relationship to them comes about from, you know, one object to another object and then a relationship happens. Sort of a, a, a way of thinking about how the world operates is it's the relationship that exists first and then the objects are the what it come out of the relationship. So that that's important for understanding um, uh, the way the way I work, the projects that I work on. I think about the relationships being the primary material, and the other aspects, the other objects, the other human beings exist as a result of those relationships. So it's just a way of thinking about. What is the thing that's the most important? Where is the energy of effort going to go? And to me, it's the relationships that are at the core of things. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my first shows was called The Agency of Things as a curator. Um, and it was a, a collection of artists that I brought together who in their work presented ideas that objects that things themselves had a capacity to influence these relationships. So it's not just human beings that through our mental capacities, our consciousness can think about how to modify the environment around them. Objects can modify the environment around them as well. And thinking too about the agency and the power that objects have to modify and influence the environment around them is also a way of thinking um, about the world around us. And this is why art is fundamentally important to me because art, objects that are created, unique objects that are created by artists, do have this power to influence the way we think about our place in the world, to influence other industries. Art is often the place in which experimentation and innovation with materials and with process happens and then drives new ideas and this happens in music in, in literature in film um, in, in fine art um, in craft in design and all of all of this sort of prioritizing the importance and significance of the of objects and objects that are made by human beings for the purpose of engaging with other human beings and influencing the world so these are the sort of ideas that sit at the base of you know the work that I do. Another, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to interject and say I love that you're so keen on collaboration that you even you know collaborate with plants. That that's that's the conduit for you and has been you know the basis for that show, but seems to be the basis of um, your whole um, interaction with artists and with the greater public is collaboration and leveraging um, off those relationships with other people. Yeah, I, th I think that is where the great strength lies. You know, there's that cliche that, you know, um, uh, you can create something that's stronger than the sum of its parts. So, and, you know, another sort of cliche that drives me to is a rising tide lifts all boats. So <laughs> the idea that working together, we can make um, wonderful things happen. And again, you know, going back to, my thoughts about the natural world where there's an ecosystem of relationships that's where the blossoming of amazing things take place and so this collaboration yeah with other partners both living and non-living um, sets a composition that creates you know a field of energy and in which things can take place you know that's the guiding principle to the Kyneton Contemporary Art Triennial and what we're trying to do up here in central Victoria. Um, and that, that came about, so talking about community and collaboration and how these things can evolve and um, come into being, you know, there's, a, there's an aspect of kind of identifying threads, identifying little compositional elements that you can just see, but then require a bit of cultivation to really bring to life. Mm -hmm. So in Kyneton, um, just by the nature of the of where it is and the circumstances of the socioeconomic climate of the last 10 years, there's been a lot of people who've, creative people that have moved out of the city, out of Melbourne in particular, although there's a lot of Adelaide people in Kyneton as well, but have moved out of cities because of the difficulty in having space for creative practitioners. 
So you can move an hour out of the city. Uh, there's a train line here and a freeway. You can move an hour out of the city and have a bit of space. I could move from a two bedroom flat in the city and come up and have a three bedroom house with a shed. And so a lot of, a lot of arts practitioners were moving out of the city to take advantage of that. And uh, in Kyneton, uh, on a Saturday morning, um, I, we would, I would have a cup of coffee um, at a cafe and over the course of a few weeks would meet these people um, who I recognised from my industry or someone would say, oh, there's Michael, he's just come back from a show and you'd get to know other arts practitioners in town. And it was evident that there was a lot of artists and curators and people working in the museums and gallery sector all found our way here in this small town and an unusual number of them. And over a course of these conversations and going to a few parties and stuff, I started to think, well, there's a bundle of us who are in the same sort of community, the same occupational community, the same interests. And we go off generally to the city or Bendigo's the other city in the other direction for us go off and do this work and um, other artists had, were going off for shows at Art Basel in Hong Kong or going all over Australia and then coming back to Kyneton and talking about the things that we were doing on a Saturday morning or at a, a party on a Saturday night. And it just dawned on me uh, that we were all going off to do these interesting things and participating in the industry and being part of the infrastructure of the industry. But where we lived, we all come back here um, why don't we actually create some of that infrastructure for ourselves here so we don't have to go off to visit these shows or go away to work with these other people? Why don't we create a set of, you know, an infrastructural foundation here that would bring those people to this town? There must be a reason that all of these creative people were suddenly lobbed together in this same small town. There must be some reason for that. So that was a sort of, you know, impetus for me to then start to drive towards developing this collective, mm. start to think about building an infrastructure. Mm. Started with that. And I was, as I said, I was thinking about ways of thinking about the exhibition model, the presentation of artwork. And to my mind, there's a, a basic kind of triumvirate, the triangle of relationships that I always think of in that regard. And it's very basic, it's just art, architecture and audience that's the that's the three things that sit together to create an exhibition outcome and those things sort of have different meaning so art includes the artists and can be anything artistic any expression artistic expression architecture can be anything that's a foundational basis like literally architecture buildings spaces like museums and galleries it can be a town, a streetscape, that's an architecture. It could be digital. It could be an internet, you know, website. That's an architecture. And then the audience is the people that are engaging with the artwork. So those, you know, when I think about the projects that I do, they're the sort of three elements that become the primary focal point of building a project up. Um, so, you know, for thinking about developing something in Kyneton, art was getting artists together to make the art. The architecture was the town and the audience was the community here, but then also the arts community as well. So there's different sort of levels of audience. And also for, for KCAT, the audience is also artists. And that's something that um, having, work, you know, working in institutions in the, the system um, is something that's really important and doesn't get talked about a lot is artists are our audience, um, a fundamental part of our audience. And, and to serve that audience is, is really fundamentally important. Mm. What institution or organisational structure you're working for. Um, so in terms of the collaboration and the collective endeavour of KCAT, um, drawing together a group of people that could work in a collective was fundamentally important. So I've also got some sort of strong opinions about the way there's hierarchies and structures that exist um, in our cultural activities and that that's across all sectors and it's just as relevant in the arts as it is in retail or sport or politics, the hierarchy and structure of things. To my mind, because I think of things sort of ecologically. There are, there are important hierarchies, but 
where things are most dynamic to me is where um, hierarchies are broken down and there is an equivalency. So when I spoke to a few people about starting up Kind and Contemporary and when I researched what, what other Biennale, you know, the Biennale model is something that KCAT works into, this idea that it's a cyclical event, that it's multi-site um, and that it sits slightly outside of the the structure, the, what do we call it, the sort of entertainment cultural complex that is museums and, you know, the kind of the hardware of our industry sits slightly outside of that. Um, I did a lot of research into how those things worked. And one of the things that was evident was that, especially in, in art and in contemporary art, there's a sort of a move away from the auteur, the director of the, cur the curator, even though the you know, there was a strengthening of the curator's presence in our world. Um, I was sort of fighting against that a little bit, partly because I started as an artist and I still actually consider myself an artist first and a curator second. That puts too much, to my mind, too much emphasis on the producer um, and too much authority in the hand of the curator and the director. And you can see it play out through other um, triennials and biennials around the world. There was a move away from that auteurship and directorship and uh, trying to open up to have more voices in the mix. Some of that came around the Western world's realisation that it was too centric on its own history and its own needs and opening up to um, other aspects of world voices, but then also breaking down that hierarchical model of having one person dictate outcomes of cultural events and allowing a more grassroots involvement. So KCAT was developed specifically and intentionally to be an art collective. Now, even though we have, we have two co-directors, you know, and that, that is also deliberately a strategy as well. There's, there has to be someone by virtue of some of the systems that are in place that's sort of the final arbiter of a decision. And this, this comes out in collective action all the time too. At some point, someone has to you know, draw a conclusion in things like, you know, basic things like setting up our structure legally as an incorporated non-profit organisation, you need a secretary, you need someone who is the, you know, the, the responsible person for submitting papers, all that kind of stuff. So there has to be, you know, some, some person, but in terms of the way we operate our collective, it's a collective voice. But as I said, there's two co-directors. So that was a strategy too. So rather than even though there's some obligation to have some figure, you know, some figurehead in some situations, our strategy was like, well, let's not have one then, let's have two as a demonstration of our collective endeavour. So even at the point at which we have to have someone who's sort of, you know, nominally the director, we can actually legally make that two people. So let's do that. And that demonstrates that it's, you know, even at the final point of decision, there's still multiple voices. There's never only just one voice. Mm. So Needham is the co-director of, um, uh, of KCAT. And there's part, partly strategy and partly circumstance to that too. That was important for me that, you know, it wasn't a grey-bearded white man who was running these things. It was, an, you know, there was a sharing of gender um, sort of, a balance as well not and i say that not because it was tokenistic but because claire is a genius at running these things and it was appropriate to have a good balance and we work together well thinking about our kind of you know ecosystem of offerings claire is really very well structured and organized and um thoughtful and careful and i'm a little um erratic and airy and um, ideas driven but we both work really well together we balance that out mm. that's another element to our collective as well the people that we draw together we allow the skill sets of each individual person to find their place in the collective everyone's allowed a voice everyone's allowed to put forward their particular interests decisions then are collectively made and over time the kind of the the cohort, we started with 10 and we've sort of stayed at about 10 or 11 for our committee. Um, it's worked out well. Ken, uh, can I ask you how that committee came together? Did you do a call out or did you personally invite people to be part of the collective? 
Uh, good question. So that started, uh, the impetus for that was me. So uh, I started I started with Claire first and said, I've got this idea to do something. I think you and I should run it. And I think, you know, us as co-directors, for all the reasons I said before, would be appropriate. I think we should ask A, B, C, D and E. And she said, yes. And what about F? And yes. And then we asked them all. Yep. In my lounge room, we just had a meeting and we said, this is what we'd like to do. And then there was one or two people that got added in from the collective who, you know, they came along. So there's eight of us at the first meeting and a couple of people said, well, we should ask Joe and Jenny. And so then we expanded that way. So yeah, it sort of started, yeah, that way. And are your roles really defined and were they defined in that first instance or has it been an organic kind of discovery of who can do what or who wants to do what? Yeah, good question. No, it started off very open-ended and, um, we allowed that situation to play out. So we, you know, we said, we've drawn you here because you're an artist or you're a curator, but you may not want, you may want the opportunity to expand your um, skill sets or experience. So if there's something else you want to do, so we left it up to the group. Some were more forthcoming in their commitment and interest. So, you know, some saw it as a professional development opportunity and would say, you know, I do this in my day job, but I need this skill set. So can I work in this area? But it was really a sort of slow momentum. And then over time, certain, um, certain roles have become more solidified. And in the first KCAT, it was very organic, very loose. And uh, the second KCAT has sort of solidified a little bit. So there's, you know, we've um, taken a new member on for the second KCAT, Angie Connor, who's our, now our development manager. Um, and we've got a treasurer now. So, you know, I did that before by myself, but we brought in someone with some financial experience who's a treasurer. So it's sort of starting to solidify into a structure, which is both um, a positive thing to me because it means we've got people who are able to bring skill sets and, you know, build their own capacity. So this was also about, this whole project was about giving all of us an opportunity to expand our you know, career potential and our skill sets. Um, but there's also a caution, always a cautionary tone with me. Every time things start to solidify, I get very cautious about how, how solid those things, how calcified those uh, sort of hierarchies are starting to take place. So we're, all, we're all mindful that there's this balancing act between having some sense of structural solidity and some sense of responsibility that sits with particular people but they're not allowing that to get too calcified um, and locking out any possibility for change. So there's a yeah, delicate balance between finding that um, equilibrium. Mm. Um, yeah. I was going to say, we've got a few questions, but I also, there's something before we go to the questions that I want to kind of note that, I kind of see that the beauty of KCAT being that it's not, you know, it brings tourists to the city, it's for the artists, it's for the local businesses, but it also brings, we were kind of discussing this the other day, Kent, that it also brings artists from around the nation to a location that I guess is, is not distracting or it's not competing with the artists. It's not a major city that's saying, we're doing this thing over here and we're better than that other city. There's none of that kind of competitiveness or comparison within Kyneton. It's, this is who we are. We're so happy to have you here and we've got a lot to offer you. Um, and I guess that provides an environment for all of the artists to be equal. Everyone that's visiting, they don't come with their own stuff. They're just there together. Just that, that's kind of, an observation is that true do you think and do you think that's something that's um uh responded to well received well yeah that in, in fact that that was sort of part of the design as well so we we wanted to have artists from all over australia to come and yeah. it's sort of there's always there's always multiple purposes in these decisions so mm -hmm. one of the reasons for that was to um we wanted to create a platform in which we could have artists meet each other across state borders so we could bring um i saw tom here before we could bring tom across from adelaide and he would be able to meet uh, beck and connie from sydney and they would get to know each other's practice and it was an opportunity for artists to share work and relationships across state borders mm -hmm. and place like Kyneton is sort of this floating, floating periphery zone. So they're not meeting in Melbourne, which has its own kind of, you know, intense scene about it, not meeting at another um, part of the infrastructure. It's almost like, you know, 
in a solar system, we can shoot out to Pluto and Uranus can, people of Uranus can meet the people of Mars out on Pluto and have a conversation in a neutral kind of zone. Yeah. That, that was important to us. But then it was also important for our community who, um, and I, I think particularly of um, the kids in our community, who mm. they want to see um, high quality Australian contemporary art. They'll need to get on a train, um, go to the city, go to an excursion. They can, surely we can have them have that opportunity here and bring that um, to, to a small regional town. Mm. So there's sort of both of those elements. It's to serve the, you know, the territory that, that it's on and then to serve the people that are, we're bringing to that territory as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's always this kind of multiple, multiple stakeholder considerations that take place. Mm. But at the heart of it, at the heart of KCAT, the, the principal driving force was artists, to provide an opportunity for artists to expand their practice in a different setting than they would normally have the opportunity to do, to give them a chance to spend a bit of time to work on ideas that might be outside of their normal interests, particularly artists who might have, you know, commercial gallery representation. Um, you know, you, you have an op sort of an expectation to continue making particular work to sell through your gallery. But if you've got different conceptual drives that you want to push or a different process you want to try, KCAT's the space to do it in an environment where there's people who are curious about what you're doing with no expectations about your past as an artist. So that, that sort of sits at the heart of it. And then as a consequence of that, having it being art-led and having artists, giving artists the freedom to make work, they bring a particular energy and it creates a, um, an interesting focal point for the town. You know, who, who are these people coming in, thinking about our town, thinking about, you know, making new work. There's a curiosity in the town then that drives this energy that feeds each other. So the artists get fed by the curiosity of the town. The town gets fed by this kind of new insight of engagement to the community here. And it just sort of drives a, you know, an, an energy cycle. That's great. Thank you, Ken. We have a couple of questions that I'm going to read out. One or two, actually, are from Henry Wolf. Um, with your positioning of relationships as primary and the idea that objects or people are made to exist through these relationships, how does this affect the agency of the object or the person? Oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so by attend, attending to the relationships, my belief is by, by attending to the relationships and thinking about um, then multiple relationships. So you have the relationships between, a, a relationship between two things and you introduce a third thing and then you've got a triangle of relationships and a fourth and now suddenly you've got a cross firing of relationships. This is where it starts for me to get interesting, where those relationships start to bridge and touch across each other, across different things mm. uh, it's very sort of conceptual but that that is the point at which um, cross firing of characteristics and a cross firing of energy takes place um, for the first kcat for example there was aspects to that that were from the artist's work were more performative than we expected so there was artists making work that was um yeah performative so there was like Beck and Connie from Sydney were doing these kind of unveilings in town and presenting themselves at podiums and talking about the town and being very performative. And Sarah Rudledge was running around town with people and you could join a running group and running around town. And where they started to overlap, like literally overlap, became points of interest. So, you know, Sarah would run from one art location to another art location, to the foundry where there was some art being exhibited, run through town, find her way to Tom's work at the Pine Forest. But where there was an overlap um, of territory between Beck and Connie talking about the lack of female representation on our public monuments, that activated some element of the geography in town and the, the, the imprint of the human body in that space. So that's where things get interesting for me and that then the objects themselves pick up characteristics from other relationships. So it's sort of a fairly abstract kind of consideration, but that, that's where things start to get interesting to me. Those relationships between things, when they start to overlap and touch each other, there's like a little frisson or a little spark that energises something. 
Is there anything you want to add to that, Henry? No, I think that's fantastic. And it's really cool to hear that the beginning of that has, or that the beginning process seemed to come out of performance kind of based projects that is something that I'm passionate about. And I think that I asked that question from a personal perspective where I've been doing works so that look at how um, potentially the other or the face of an other positions and creates our own identities and where we sit in those relationships then as a result of that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to ask the next question? Henry? Certainly. <laughs> um, I, I just, <laughs> I thought it was really interesting, the, um, the idea that uh, an exhibition could exist across a whole town. Mm -hmm. And I guess, how does that shift the audience's relationship to the viewing of the works when that happens? Yeah. Yeah, it's been really interesting to see it, see it play out. And um, so for the first one, one of the, one of the things that I, I was hoping to do um, was um, it would give people who were coming from outside of town into a regional town an opportunity to see how a regional town actually functions. So for most of the time, tourists will come to a, a location see the major tourist attractions, the waterfalls, the, the, the restaurants that are of, of note, geological features, there's those kind of touchstone points. But by putting the artwork distributed around town, it meant people from outside the town could actually come into other parts of the town that they normally wouldn't see and get a better insight into what regional communities are like. Mm -hmm. You go to shops or into offices or the back laneways that you wouldn't normally go to. So there was an opportunity to, to give that give that experience to people visiting the town the other advantage too was that it meant that for people who do live in the town there were parts of the town that they don't normally go to just by virtue of their normal habitual kind of activities you go to the supermarket you drop your kids off you drive the same streets back and forth from town but you'd be able to go and visit buildings that aren't normally open to public access you always wondered what is in that factory now you can go and have a look. You can learn that that factory, you know, that was one of the great projects was Georgie Mattingly. It was in a, an old foundry um, that had been empty for 20 years. A lot of the people in town had arrived in the last 20 years, a significant portion, didn't know what it was or had been forgotten for so long. Um, they discovered that there was, it was a huge part of the industry of Kyneton. A lot of the people who work there are quite old and living in nursing homes now. And it gave the people who, you know, and the people who were in the nursing home who felt like the city, the town had moved on, all these new people had come, their kind of, the past was gone, they were forgotten about, they were in a nursing home. It was, you know, it was a kind of sad aspect to that. But then they could see that people were coming in and enjoying learning about their uh, contribution to the town. The people of the town were like, God, there was this great huge industry here. It was really powerful. And here are the people that made it happen. They came in on buses from the nursing home and could see other people totally enthralled by their work. They felt a sense of pride and recognition of the contribution to the town that they made. So it was finding different ways audiences could, could um, experience living in the town and the, the history of the town. Mm that made it really interesting for, for both the visitors and the people that live in the town. I guess that structure is really, um, you know, we've, all, we've kind of experienced that in Venice with the Biennale and other kind of European cities that have bigger Biennales, but their cities are kind of tourist cities to begin with. So you're not, that cities aren't necessarily igniting new spaces that haven't really been used, that the whole place is being used. So I think that's a really interesting part for Kyneton that it's also the locals that are discovering more about their town. Yeah, yeah. And I guess too, with, the, with some of the other um, biennales, and that's something we thought about too, you know, they're bringing a lot of international artists, bring works in that they'd made. One of the fundamental characteristics to KK is we ask artists to come and spend time in Kyneton. They don't, they don't have to make work about Kyneton by any stretch, but I want them to come and experience just being in town and allow that to, you know, that experience of being here, whether it's seeing the stars at night, eating breakfast at one of the cafes in the morning, um, watching, you know, being here long enough to see the sun pass all the way from one horizon to the next, sort of, you know, imbue their human body with the being in this place. Um, and then, you know, reflect on that to make work. They don't have to, again, make work about Kyneton, 
But as a consequence of that experience being here, mm. um, that imbues their work. Yeah. For the, some artists, they really took that on board and really researched elements of the town, and that was great too because that gave um, a good site-specific quality to some of the work. Mm -hmm. um, others, it just sort of, you know, it just helped add relevance to work that was produced outside of here, but it gave them consideration about, you know, which parts of the work they would show, which venue would be appropriate to show it in. So, you know, all the work is imbued um, by its relevance and connection. Again, that relationship, you know, their relationship to the artist and the space and the place mm. is, is as important on, if not more important, than the objects that are placed there in the end. Yeah. We have a couple of other questions that I'll read through just before we do our breakout session, Kent. So um, from Patty, we have, were all the members from Melbourne or predominantly from Kyneton and Bendigo? Uh, all, at the very beginning, all from Kyneton. And that was really specific because the, the story that we wanted to tell at the beginning and the way that it, I could see an advantage for getting funding mm -hmm. was to tell that story, that, that specifically unique story. There are... This is the way we could sell it to the funding bodies, which is also truthful to the, the relevance of the project. There are 10 artists and curators that live in this town of only 7,000 people, and we all work at these venues, and we all show internationally and nationally. Mm. It is that. If you support us and help us draw from our broad networks in this town, we can use that as a model for demonstrating the interesting aspects of any town where there are any groups of people drawn together into a community whose set of relationships have a strength to it. So at the first instance, it had to be people from Kyneton because that was a fascinating story to tell. Mm -hmm. You could imagine someone opening the paper and going, God, all of these people from the one industry in this one town, what is going on there? And yeah. there's straight away. And there's but your marketing background. <laughs> Paid off. <Yeah. laughs> Since then, we've drawn in a couple from just outside of Clinton, but being, being Central Victorian is a, is a fundamental part of the uh, context sensitivity. So there's site specificity and there's context sensitivity. I'm about context sensitivity, and so having Central Victorians as the committee members is important to us. Mm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, two other questions from Bell Howden are from responding to earlier in our conversation. And what might be a sign of calcification, Kent? Oh, that's a good one. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and it can vary from things to things. Longevity, for me, like I've seen coming into the industry, um, there's people in roles that are in roles for too long, I think. So, you know, directors of museums that have been there for 16 years, that... You can be a brilliant director and you could make the case that for some people that's okay, but I don't, I think that's too long. In a culture in which most of us change jobs, you know, every three years or even careers every seven, I think being in the job for too long can be a problem. Um, so that, that can be an issue and in a role, in a role, in a role for too long. Um, and language is another one. So I can see in particular institutions, so, you know, my day job is in a gallery in a university. Um, I can see in institutions the language that's communicated out of particular institutions becomes so um, unique to that institution that it becomes circular. You see that in occupations, you know, accountants talk one way, artists and critics and curators talk <laughs> language. Once that starts happening, then there's, there's too, it's too insular. It's a whirlpool and there's no, you know, any energy that comes close to that whirlpool gets sucked into it and there's not enough generative energy. So, yeah, they're the general too long in one spot and the language that starts getting used as signs for me that something is calcifying. And then, you know, the, the result of that is the speed of things. Things are too slow. Decisions are too slow. And that, that happens too in institutions as you get, bodies, committees, levels of authority on decision making, things slow down. Such a great observation, Ken, and so beautifully articulated. Um, Bell also asks what actions to take to prevent that process from taking place. Ah. Yeah, well, I guess there's the, the natural ones of like, if someone, you know, ensuring that someone can't be in a role for too long or a robust 
review of, you know, is it appropriate to continue with this person in this role for this amount of time? Mm. A lot of the time that means the person with the to make that decision is the one in that role. So it's not easy for the number to tap on their shoulder and go, you've been in this role for too long, clear out. <laughs> you know, somehow that's got to be interjected into it. So, you know, at, at La Trobe where I work, one of the things we've instigated is we always have, um, you know, a, a new curator voice come in. We've got, you've got to create a space to have someone else come in with a different point of view mm. and step aside at least for a moment to interject something new into the equation. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, so those characteristics that are a problem, like language becomes another one, is finding ways of reviewing what, what is the materials you're expressing your work through. Um, and speed, you know, are you, are you keeping up with things? Are you modifying and changing things fast enough? They're difficult to answer if you are in that process of calcification because you think, and, you know, I can see this happening, this kind of confidence in the work you're doing. I'm doing a good job. Why would I step aside now? This is, everything's getting better. I'm improving with age. Mm. Um, it becomes tricky then to, you know, for that person or that role to start questioning themselves. Mm. And the collective operation to me is important to have a few more voices. So, you know, on our, in our collective, there's 10 of us and we, have, we work with 10 artists. There's 10 on the committee and the collective and there's 10 artists generally, you know. Mm to to try and create a sense of balance and engagement i think that's why from an organizational point of view it's so important to um give opportunity a given a platform for the voice of the artist because really it's not about the organization it's about the community that the organization is part of and there are so many avenues and and perceptions from from every artist yeah yeah and artists the artists are at the core of everything we do artists mm. You know, the biggest problem I found when I came across from the corporate world, directors of museums are paid $200,000. Um, artists are paid peanuts. Artists are the reason directors have a job. And artists, you've always got to make sure that every decision you make, what is, what is this doing for artists and what is this doing for art? The biggest problem we have in the arts industry is everything is set up to give the power to the administrators and not the creators. And that's a constant bugbear with me. And that's why, you know, KCAT is about the art, art and the artists. That's a central thing and we're there for, to facilitate that activity. Um, and, you know, a way of resolving calcification, because calcification happens in the administration. Calcification doesn't happen in the artistic practice. Artistic practice is where the energy and the innovation happens. So, driving more of the focus towards what's happening with art and artists and take the energy and focus out of the administration. You need the administration, but that isn't the principal focus. Art, art making. Do you think art institutions are changing? Is the energy and the innovation within art institutions changing over years, do you think? Yeah, I think it is a little bit because there's a, there's a changing away from... Um, curators being administrators and, um, you know, there's the kind of librarian curator and there's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's, there's a place for that. You, you know, you, you keep everything well archived, you look after and you care for it and you put it up on the wall and you explain why it's important and there's a role for that. Mm. But more curators and sort of a, a people moving into this space who are either artists themselves or see the dynamic possibility of opening up... Um, real present action with art and um, the creation of artwork. So not just the cataloging and storing of old artworks or artworks already created, a dynamic opportunity for artists and, art, uh, and practitioners to make new work and to support the making and the process of work. Mm. Um, so yeah, I see that changing. And there's, there's people like me who come, there's a lot of you know, curators who started as artists. There's, there's almost a sequential kind of, um, process with some artists where like me they sort of expand their practice from thinking about you know an object to a group of people in a space to an architecture and you can't help but then go well I'll just organize the whole show myself <laughs> but there's quite a few of us that have moved into that area you know who are now institutional curators who are artists first and come with this kind of art art is where it starts you know we're here to support the art so I, I do think that is changing and you know an awareness that 
there's directors and curators who are, especially in a situation like we're in now with the pandemic, they've got the stable jobs, they've got the income and the artists, the whole reason we exist, have got very little and very precarious support and very precarious opportunities. Um, so yeah, I do see it changing, not as fast as I would like, but it's, it's changing. Thank you. We have one last question before we start doing the breakouts. It's from Heidi Kenyon. She says, hi Kent, have you come across a philosopher, Michael Serres, who wrote about a desmology, a study of the relationships between things, as opposed to a study of being ontology? Yes, totally. So yeah, Michael Serres was part of my PhD, yeah, dissertation. So yes, I'm familiar with that work. And there's, um, there's a whole series of um, um, sort of articles and, and um, ideas around, so, you know, my principal interest is art and contemporary art, but um, maybe also because of my background, I'm just as interested in the way, you know, a, a, a glass is made or a pen is made, a door handle is made, and Michael Serres talks about this, about, you know, how a shoe is made and the implications that that object has on the way um, it has agency over our behaviours. So, you know, um, I'm conscious too that there's, you know, um, this kind of delineation between art, craft, design, fine art, real art, utility art. It doesn't really matter to me. It's what, what has an impact on people's lives. Um, and so, yeah, his, his sort of thoughts in that area are of great interest to me as well. So the relationship that the way something, a door handle is designed and the consequences that has on the people that use that door handle. I think about it in my house. I've got a door handle that's at my height. My kids can't reach it. So the design of that door handle has an implication on the life that my children lead by the access that they have through that door handle. And, you know, it's kind of a rough door handle. So every time I open it, I'm conscious of the feeling that I have in my hand. It impacts my life. That object is influencing every sort of feeling I have and consequence when I go through that process every day. Um, they're the sort of things that I find fascinating and interesting. Art being one of those things that doesn't have a utility, but does have a utility because it influences our thinking about our place in the world, um, is a fascinating area because it's a little bit more abstract and a, a little bit more off kilter. Um, so yeah, Michael Serres is, um, is an interesting, um, yeah, philosopher. And there's a great relationship there between um, the functionality and craftsmanship. Yeah, absolutely. As well. Um, Victoria, I'm going to ask you to please set up some breakouts. If not, I'll take this opportunity to thank Kent Wilson for being wonderful. That was a great session. Thank you so much. I think we not only learnt more about what KCAT is, but also how we can interact with one another and I guess question um, some of our motives or some of our ways as to working within communities. So thank you so, so very much. A little round of applause for Kent. <laughs> Um, and thank you to the rest of you for joining us today. It's been a delight to see you all here and to have you participate. Um, this is a very new program for us at Guildhouse having breakouts. And um, I think it's been a really great success from this session and our previous session that we've run earlier this week. Um, so if you have any feedback about our, the method behind our madness, please fill out our survey. We're sending one, um, I think we might be popping one in the link and I'll be sending one afterwards. And whatever feedback you're able to give us will inform the next session and the general program at Guildhouse, which we want to always have the voice of the artist at the forefront. So the most that you can tell us, then the more our sessions will be relevant to you and tailored to you. Um, tonight we have a really fun platform, wacky interaction mingling activity <laughs> in an online platform called Gather Town where we will be avatars walking around talking to people and the four main people that we will have in the room are um, four prestige prestigious curators from around Australia, from Carriage Works, Powerhouse Museum, NGV and Stations Gallery and they will be 
there and available to talk to local artists. So it's your opportunity to not only talk to each other, but also introduce yourself to some curators and, and have a chat about what they're doing during lockdown, what they're planning, what shows they can put you in, all of those things. Um, and the um, speaker session continues tomorrow. That will be our last day for this September series. At one o'clock, Heidi Canyon will host a session with Amy Hurrigan called Practical Tips and Tricks for Increasing Your Online Viability. And that evening, we'll conclude the spring series with Guildhouse CEO Emma Fay, who will speak to Daniel Slater from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and Lisa Slade from AGSA at 7 p.m. So please, um, it's not too late to sign up to those events. Events. In coming weeks, we will release details of the summer program. So again, any feedback that you can provide is, is really useful to that, um, to programming that. And our tech mentorship program that I mentioned at the beginning of the session is accepting applications until the 30th of September. That's open to South Australian artists. So please hop on the website and have a look at that. It's a great opportunity for artists to grow digital skills through tailored one-on-one -on -one sessions. So um, please check that out. Again, thank you to Kent. Lovely to see you all and um, see you soon. Thank you, bye. <laughs>